Welcome to Making Money. I'm Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me here today. It is December 14th. Only 11 days, folks, to the big day. The big guy comes down the chimney. Well, I have some early Christmas presents for you. I have four stocks, all under $2 billion valuation each in the service sector that is looking strong. And I have a great chart to tell you why these stocks are set to take off. We're going to talk inflation. We're going to talk the Fed meeting this week, today, and tomorrow. So much more coming up right now on Making Money. Hey folks, once again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. As I mentioned, um, you know, Christmas Eve has always been my favorite day of the year. I think as a kid going back, all my family would get together at my grandparents' house. We'd go to church and then we'd go there. And it's funny, you know, I, I talk about my blue collar upbringing a lot. And I think that's important because it shows, you know, hard work will get you a lot of places. You know, we never talked about the stock market ever in my family. Uh, maybe because my grandfather, a lot of my family members worked at Bethlehem Steel, which was once a Dow 30 stock and then went bankrupt. So I don't think the stock market treated them that well. Maybe that's why we didn't discuss it. But that Christmas Eve, I always loved because I saw cousins I only saw like once or twice a year from all over the place. But we go to church and the church was maybe a half mile away from my grandparents' house. I also went to school there, you know, little town. We would sprint back because the big thing was that there was shrimp, you know, the, the cocktail shrimp. But because you had a bunch of growing boys, all kinds of cousins, uncles, there wasn't a lot. We only could only afford so much. So if you weren't there first to get in line for that shrimp cocktail, you weren't eating shrimp cocktail till next year. So it's funny how it brings back those memories. So I hope everybody is getting ready for the big holiday season. Uh, as I mentioned, 10 days away from the big Christmas Eve. But today, let's talk about the markets. Uh, we're going to talk about the continued volatility, the continued pullback we're seeing in some of the technology companies. Uh, this morning, we had another inflation number come out. I'm going to dive into that for you. And then we're going to talk about four stocks that fall into what we call the sectors and the consumer area, which is kind of nice setting up for Christmas. Also, I have a chart that shows you exactly why I'm so bullish on that sector right now. So let's dive into it here first. And I'm going to pull up a chart of the uh, S&P 500 here for you. We're down about eh, six tenths of a percent on the S&P 500 here today. And uh, I'm zoomed out a little bit here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit further here for you. As you can see, we're pulling back. We're near the lows of the session right now. And a big reason for that is the inflation number I'm going to talk about here in a moment. But I also want to take a look at uh, another chart. And this is the ARK Innovation ETF, ARKK. And the reason I'm showing you this, even though it's only down a half percent kind of with the market today, you can see if it closes here, it'd be the lowest close in about 13 months. And that means something. Uh, that just shows the weakness that we have seen. When we talk about the markets, folks, you know, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as well. You know, I talk about the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Dow, the Russell 2000, all the major averages, only a few percentage points off an all time high. But I just showed you the ARK, the ARKK. That's down over 25% off an all-time high. That is now in officially a bear market. So that is important to keep in mind because even though the, the overall market is not getting hit as much, a lot of your growth stocks probably are. And that's why you want to be diversified. You want to put all your eggs in one basket. You don't want to have all smoke, small cap growth stocks. You don't want to have all tech stocks. You want to have some bellwethers in there. You want to have some other asset classes, whether it be real estate or REITs, um, maybe some cryptocurrencies, which they're pulling back as well. But you want to have diversification because over time, that's what happens. I've seen a lot of tweets come out recently. Uh, and if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Matthew McCall. Uh, a lot of tweets come out recently and comments here uh, on a YouTube page about, oh, Matt, you know, your stocks that you've recommended recently, uh, you know, at my old company, they're down, they're down. Listen, folks. When I put out these recommendations, I always say three, five, seven years, if not longer. These are long-term themes that take time to play out. I don't know where stocks are going in three months or six months, even a year. So many things can happen. So many outside factors can move stocks. Companies get to valuations that are overvalued and they pull back and become very undervalued. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment as well. Because valuations right now, a lot of these stocks and, a lot of, and the market itself are looking pretty good. And I'll tell you why 2022, I think, is going to be a good year. So keep in mind, when you're playing long-term trends, you have to hold for the long term. That's why it's called long-term. All right. So one chart I want to show you here is I, I, I talked about the um, 
this morning, the uh, uh, inflation number coming out. So we had the PPI come out with the producer price index. Last week was a CPI, the consumer price index. So the CPI the consumer price index are prices that you pay as a consumer when you go to the store, when you fill up your tank with gas, when you go buy food, etc. The PPI, it's the, what the producers have to pay, the production. So the PPI was up 9.6% year over year. The estimate was for 9.2%. This PPI number, the producer price index, has only been around since 2010. It's the highest level since they've been keeping it. The core PPI, which removes food and gas, was up 6.9%, the highest since they started keeping that in 2014. But it was actually below the estimates. Either way, very hot numbers, which led to the market selling off this morning because we're in a two-day Fed meeting right now which means tomorrow the Fed will come out and they'll talk about the view on tapering, raising interest rates next year, uh, probably moving the word transitory from inflation. So there's a lot of volatility, a lot of unknowns between now and tomorrow afternoon when Powell comes out. So that's, again, why you're seeing the market pull back, in my opinion. And these numbers are scaring people uh, just a bit. But I want to pull up a chart here for you. And this is a chart that one of my colleagues shared with me this morning. And this is of the producer price index. And this is by commodity. So it measures commodities. And if I take a look here, and uh, my colleague did this, and he looked back at the numbers from November 2019 uh, to this past month. And in November, December 2019, 2019 uh, before obviously the pandemic took off, we had a reading about 199. This month, it's at 243 and change. So that's a change of roughly 22.4% in that time frame. And you can see in this chart that huge spike up. You know, for years it went flat. So the big spike up in the value, the cost of these commodities for the producers. And a lot of times, obviously, that gets passed on to the consumer. Well, what he also looked at was two other situations. August 79 through 1981 August, it was up 24.4%. I just mentioned we're up 224 and then July 20, 2006 through July 2008, it was up 23.2%. So all very similar situations. So what happened in these time frames? Well, you can see here, we hit a little recession. You can see here, hit a little recession. So that's the email that I was sent by a colleague. I responded. And what I said was, do you know what else happened right after those time frames? This was August 1991, the first one, when, when the numbers he put out. In 1992, we began an 18-year cycle to the upside. 82 through 2000 was one of the greatest cycles higher for stocks in the history of mankind. An 18-year bull market, basically. We had one little dip in early 1990. But an 18-year bull market, folks. The other one was 2008. You know what happened March 2009, a few months later? One of, again, one of the great bull markets of our time, all the way through the pandemic, 10 straight years, and now we're seeing it again. So think outside the box when you see some of these numbers, because I truly think, again, just another catalyst as to why the roaring 2020s are going to continue to take off and stocks will outperform. Will there be rough months and rough quarters like we're having right now with growth stocks? Absolutely. There'll be rough years. You don't go straight up. But again, all the numbers are aligning for what will be a great decade for investors. Investors that have the fortitude to continue to hold and not get spooked out. And that's important. One more bullish big picture here thing for you as well is valuations. So, the S&P 500, the earnings there expected this year, once the fourth quarter comes in, to be around $206 uh, for the S&P. Next year, the estimates range between about $223 to $233. I'm on the upper end of the range. Jeffries is up there as well, the investment firm. So let's cut it down the middle and say next year, the S&P 500 comes in with earnings per share of $228 a share. If I put a multiple of 22 on that, that gives us the S&P around 5,016, which is about 8% or so higher from where it is today. If I give it a valuation of 25, 
Because again, that's current year. We're not even looking out. We'll be in a current year next year. If I give it a value of 25, it puts the S&P 500 at 5,700, which is a 23% gain from where we are today. And that's why one of my predictions, I always do predictions fun uh, and serious for every year. Uh, I always have, have fun doing it. One of them is, again, and I say this the last few years and I've been right every year, that at some point, because I don't know where the market's going to end next year, but at some point in 2022, from December 31st of this year, the S&P will be up 20%. And I'm pretty damn confident it's going to happen based on just these numbers right here. Based on that PPI I just showed you. Based on the fact that valuations are actually coming back in line for a lot of these growth stocks. We're setting up for a really, really solid rally. And I got to tell you, every day, folks, more people think I'm crazy. Every day, folks, more people are throwing in a towel. That's okay. Let them throw in the towel. I don't know anybody that's been able to throw in a towel and get back in and make money, go back and forth. It's nearly impossible. You have to stick with solid companies you know will be growing in the years ahead, but they never go straight up. The amount of times that Amazon pulled back over 50% along the way would blow your mind. And I show that chart a lot. I don't have it pulled up today, but I do show that chart a lot. So my point here is, folks, you got to stick with it. And there's a lot of reasons why. All right, so let's get into the stocks because this is where we get the fun. But I got a chart here I'm going to show you first. And this is pretty fascinating. This is um, from the Bureau of Economic Analysis and, and from Bloomberg. It shows the share of the U.S. consumption spent on goods. And we go back to, again, right here, pre-pandemic. The orange line is goods and the blue line is services. Look what happens when a pandemic happens. And again, we know this, right? Because things shut down. So we couldn't go to services. We couldn't go to restaurants. We couldn't get our hair done, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it fell from 100 all the way down to 94. At the same time, the U.S. personal spending percentage of all spending on goods skyrocketed. We're still up at 113%, so 13% higher, while at the same time, the services fell 6%. When I see a huge gap like this, it tells me this will likely come down and this is likely to come up. We're going to revert back to the mean. So what did I look for? Well, number one, I look for service companies. What type of companies that offer services are going to do well? Because as this number goes back up, more money is going to be spent on services. I hope you understand this. I, I, it's a pretty simple chart. You know, sometimes I go fast, but so what I did is I went through and I got four stocks for you. And I got to tell you, there's some crazy stocks you probably never heard of. So we're going to jump right into it. And I broke this up into two categories, folks. And the first category is what I call the new guard. And the reason I call it the new guard is because there are two newly IPO companies there are two companies that are really kind of upending uh, other companies. There are two companies that are following a bigger trend, which is we, we always want that to be part of a mega trend because that, that helps what we call the TAM, the total addressable market. If it's going after the big fish, let's say, better chance of making big money, right? More upside potential. So let's move on here to company number one. And this company is Brilliant Earth. It symbols BRLT. If you've never heard of this company, it's fascinating. I knew about this for a while. It just went public back in September. It's basically a, a next-gen jewelry company. They focus on a supply chain of transparency. So basically, all their diamonds are non-blood diamonds. You know, you probably all saw the movie uh, with Leonardo DiCaprio, Blood Diamond. Well, fantastic movie. I'm a big Leo fan. I think he could pull off so many different, um, you know, different actors, different things. And I got to tell you, if you, if I had to pick somebody else's life, I love my life. I would probably take him. I mean, that guy dates every model around the world. I mean, I don't think his life's that bad, folks. He's got a dad bod. His hair's going away, but it suddenly grows back. The guy's got the life. I got to tell you. So um, great, great movie. But this company goes after the non blood diamonds. They also have what I think is going to be the biggest trend in the next 10 years in jewelry. And this is lab-grown diamonds. Lab-grown diamonds, folks, I've done tons of research on this. 
you know, there's cubic zirconiums, and that's not a diamond. It's just, you know, some type of glass or whatever. Um, a lab-grown diamond, you actually could put under a microscope, and most jewelers can't tell the difference because it's grown just as a, a diamond grows in the earth. It's grown, though, in a lab. Fascinating. You don't have people getting paid pennies a day, working their tails off in really unsavory countries to come up with diamonds that are sold for tens of, not hundreds of thousands of dollars. These are grown in a lab. And I think the more and more younger generations okay with that. It's a $1.8 billion company. You know, they, they call themselves really the most ethical and environmentally responsible jewelry store. I get it. It's a very modern and digital experience. Uh, 15 stores right now. They just opened four new showrooms in 2000, or sorry, in uh, third quarter. So let's look at the chart here really quick. You see here how it went public. You know, the, it went public at 12 bucks is where it priced. You can see it open though, and it ran up that day and came right back down below $11. Originally, it was priced to range between 14 and 16. It closed that first day at 17.12 though. The reason I think that you did not see this company price higher is because it's not as exciting as a lot of these tech companies that have been going public in the last year. So it's just not something that you're seeing a lot of people going after. They're still looking for tech companies. So this is a company that, that I find absolutely fascinating. Uh, as I mentioned, $1.8 billion company. A lot of the diamonds they're tracking right now, they're using blockchain. So you can go in there and buy a diamond and it's tracked by the blockchain from where that diamond came from. Eventually, everything's going to be tracked by the blockchain, but I like that the company's moving forward with this. It will run into some uh, competition from Zales and some of the bigger companies out there, of course. But because it's only a $1.8 billion company, because it has such a special service, I actually walked into the showroom there in Washington, D.C. in Georgetown, and they wouldn't let me in uh, because you have to have an appointment. So it's very, you know, you kind of feel like you're really uh, going somewhere special, but you're not paying the prices that you would at some crazy high-end drawer, in my opinion. You know, the average um, order value this past quarter was $3,300, uh, 3301 to be exact. Uh, last year is $3,210. That is a lot of money, but I don't think it's outlandish if you're buying an engagement ring or something. I don't know. I might be, I, I don't know much about jewelry. But let's run through the numbers here real quick. Last year is at sales of $251 million. This year, looking for $369 million. By 2023, $615 million. This year, they're looking to be profitable, making $0.29 cents a share up to $0.59 cents in two, two years from now. So high growth, profitable. Uh, it's trading based on 2023 uh, earnings at three times, or sorry, sales, three times sales. That's inexpensive compared to a lot of these other IPOs and a lot of other companies that are growing like this. The TAM, which I talked about a moment ago, the total addressable market for the global fine jewelry market is $300 billion. Here in the US, it's $61 billion. Again, this is a very tiny company. I think there's huge upside potential for a brand like this. So the next one we're going to take a look at, we're going to take a complete shift from fine jewelry, and we're going to go over to what's uh, called solo brands. The symbol is DTC. And typically DTC stands for direct to consumer. So solo brands, it's an out, outdoor lifestyle company. Uh, they, they really kind of started out with uh, camping stoves called the solo stove. And they also have uh, fire pits under a solo brand. Uh, they have kayaks, uh, they have paddle boards on the aisle brand, they have clothes under the Chubby's brand, and a bunch of other accessories for camping and outdoors, outdoors kind of life. $1.6 billion company, so it's a tiny company as well. They IPO'd, as you can see here, uh, in October at $17 a share. They had a great first day, um, and then closed on a low of the day, but then rallied back up to the 20s. And just like a lot of other growth stocks been getting hit as of late, down to $15.50 uh, right now. You know, it's, it's symbols DTC, about 84% of its sales are direct to consumer. That means it doesn't, it's not sold through a third party. That's good because it keeps the margins uh, very high. And to give you an example of how strong this company's been, uh, from mid-2016 through the first half of this year, it's compound annual growth rate of 132%. So this has been a big, big growth story here, folks. And again, it's, it's a recent IPO. It's in a very niche area. You think about what people started doing during a pandemic because you couldn't do much. A lot of people started getting outdoorsy. But I think that trend was already here, but accelerated pretty quickly during the pandemic. And I don't think it's going anywhere. The younger generation is much more into experiences versus goods. And another reason we'll see, we should see the services really spike back from that original chart that I showed you. 
where goods have been outdoing because we've been locked in our houses. So you're buying goods versus going out and uh, spending money on services. But again, I think that's going to change and may even flip the other way at some point in the very near future. So let's look at sales. Again, $1.6 billion company. Uh, 2020, it had sales of $133 million. This year, big growth, $350 million. By 2023, $625 million. Again, folks, profitable. Earnings per share looking for 89 cents a share this year, up to a buck 11 in 2023. So based off where it's trading right now and estimates of 2023, it's trading about 14, uh, PE ratio about 14. Uh, that is low. That's, that's a very low. Price to sales uh, next year, 3.2. Again, really nice valuation for a high growth company. We're looking like this. So my question for you is, have you ever heard of this company? I didn't know much about it until I did my research. Could this be the next Yeti? We all know Yeti, right? Uh, it's like kind of the cult brand of coolers and stuff for outdoorsy people, sportsy people. A lot of people down south when I lived in Nashville had Yeti. I thought it was crazy spending so much money on a cooler or on a koozie to keep your beer cold. If it takes you that long to drink a 12-ounce beer can, you're probably drinking too slow. So you don't need that little thing to twist on it. Um, but to give you an idea, I just mentioned this company is $1.6 billion. Yeti is worth about $8 billion. Um, and then Yeti is looking uh, at a price of sales about 5.5. This is 3.2. P ratio of 30. This is 17 based on next 12 months. So it's trading, you know, about 60% of what Yeti's at. And it's got better growth going forward. So again, one to really keep your eye on. So those are what I call kind of the, you know, the, the next guard, the next generation. The next two stocks are pretty fascinating because they both fall into an area that I really know well. It falls into an area that I've that I've always been involved in my entire life. And it's in the services area because we're going towards service now. And this is in the fitness area. And as many of you know, I uh, a founder, part owner, silent owner, should say, uh, of a fitness facility. I'm actually expanding right now, taking up another floor. That's how good business is. We can't, uh, we can't even find a spot for people to come in. Uh, so it's booming right now. So that led me to obviously looking at, you know, some areas. So the first company we're going to take a look at is Exponential Fitness. Again, another recent IPO in July, XPOF. It's another one that it was trying to price its IPO in a range between 14 and 16 bucks and finally priced at 12, uh, closed the first day right above 12, drifted lower, even went below 10 bucks at one point and then took off in September up to nearly $25. We've pulled back in the last four trading days from close to an all-time high. We're at just below 20 bucks right now, around 1994. So this is a $1 billion company. It's a boutique fitness operator. You may have heard of some of these. One of my competitors in there, Club Pilates, uh, Cycle Bar, which is indoor cycling, Stretch Lab does one-on-one -on -one stretching, which is crazy. Row House, which is what it sounds like. It's rowing. Uh, AKT is a dance-based cardio workout. Uh, they own Yoga 6, Pure Bar, which is bar, Stride, a treadmill-based cardio, uh, Rumble, which is a boxing full-body inspired workout. So they own a little bit of everything. It's a really great um, business they have here, just kind of rolling everything up. Uh, just in October, they acquired their 10th brand uh, called Body Fit Trainer, which does strength and functional training. Uh, Q3, it had 248 new franchise licenses and opened 68 new franchise studios also raise their guidance. One thing I look for in companies like this is kind of who backed them. Michael Dell's a big backer of this company. We all know Michael Dell from obviously Dell. He's had great success uh, in his career. So Michael Dell's backed this as well. Uh, you look at the chart again, it's pulling back. Boy, a lot of support there at 18. And man, you look at 24, I'm like, oh, I missed it. But then it pulls back five bucks for you. So you may want to keep an eye on this one uh, down here. So let's talk numbers. As I mentioned, it's only a billion dollar company. Uh, last year did sales of about 106 million. This year looking for 148. By 2023, 232 million. So not huge growth, but good enough growth. Uh, losing money this year, uh, looking for a loss of about 73 cents a share. However, next year looking to turn a profit. We always want that path to profitability. Next year looking to turn a profit of 73 cents a share. And there's only one estimate for the year after that, but a profit of $2.55 a share. If it comes in anywhere close to that, this stock more than doubles quickly. Based on 2023, it's trading at a price of sales of four and a PE ratio of below nine. So we have a company that's really undervalued here, in my opinion, again, and a leader in so many niche areas. Um, and when you have such a diverse portfolio that they have, and I'm telling you, I'm seeing these fit, these boutique fitnesses really come back. These studios are blowing up. I see it firsthand. 
Last month, record numbers at the one that I'm a silent owner in. Record numbers by far. People are coming back. So one to put on your watch list. So another one that I'm going to take a look at is one that I have a personal story I'll share with you here. Again, another recent IPO. This company originally was going to go IPO through a SPAC, fell apart, and then went the traditional way. And this company, as you'll see here in a moment, is uh, F45 Training Holdings, uh, so known as F45. You may have some in your in your town. They're all over the world. Uh, the first one I ever went to actually was in London, in Piccadilly. Uh, symbols FXLV. It's a $1 billion company as well. Uh, the F stands for functional. It's functional 45-minute workout. So they're freaking fantastic. It started in Australia. Uh, so this one's backed. You know, the one's backed by Michael Dell. This one is backed by uh, Mark Wahlberg. For those of you who don't know Mark Wahlberg, he's the Mark Wahlberg of Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. According to Entrepreneur Magazine, it's the fastest growing franchiser in the world right now. Uh, they have 1,400 sold franchises that aren't even open yet. Uh, they have collaborations with U.S. military. Uh, they also have one with One Spa World. So they have the, the stuff on ships. So they're on cruise ships now. Uh, they're also right now uh, in the middle of buying uh, Vive Active, which is a big plotty studio in Australia. So they're expanding a bit too, which I'd like to see. But I will give you my personal story on this. So before I moved to Baltimore about two and a half years ago, uh, I wanted to expand my franchise. And I bought into the F45 franchises for all of Baltimore, my majority of Baltimore. So the plan was to open a couple of them. And I, I did all my due diligence, had a, a business partner. We, we looked at it. It's just very tough to, to for a franchise because it had to be, you know, certain ceiling height, certain site, you know, a certain size, certain rectangle. It was just a pain in the ass. So I found a spot I really loved and I said, well, it's not going to work for F45, but boy, what if we start our own? So we started our own, uh, Pilates Studio. And uh, sold back my F45 franchise to the company. They bought it back, which was great at what I paid for it. So it was a nice swap back because obviously they people wanted it. What's funny is they actually ended up opening it in one of the other spots I looked at in Fells Point. And I don't know if it's doing well. I hope they're doing well. But uh, this company, though, is, is fantastic because it's such a great workout. And it truly is functional. It's the way things are going right now. So last quarter, their visits increased by 17%. Revenue is up 24%. So good numbers as you're starting to see people get back. They had 63 studio openings. They sold another 210 franchises last quarter. Uh, at the end of the quarter, what I really like is they have no debt, sitting on about $53 million in cash. And you look at a 2021 full-year estimates, new franchises sold between 830 and 850 Studio openings between 240 and 260. Last year, they had sales of 82 million. This year, looking for 133. Next year, 263. The year after that, 327. Again, path to profitability. This year, looking to lose 43 cents a share, but by 2023, making a buck a share. So based on 2023, price of sales of three. PE ratio of 11. Where are you going to find these types of numbers in a fast-growing trend? And a solid leader. Both these companies are leaders in this trend. You know, and again, I, I, I'm giving you firsthand of what I see. I am in this business. I see it. I see how the numbers are, are doing. I see the demand for it. And again, when you come out of a recession or a shutdown or anything like that, typically you are going to see the strong survive. And the companies that make it through those rough times typically come out very, very strong on the other end. Uh I feel blessed that the, the company I have was able to come through it because I think if I had an F45 and opened it before the pandemic, it'd be tough to come through it. So uh, I feel blessed and I'm blessed for the other companies that made it through too. Pat yourselves on the back because it's not hard, not easy to come through there. You make it through the tough times and there's only so many. And now it's supply and demand, folks. The supply is spiking back up for needs for boutique fitness. People want to get back out. They want to be back in public. They want services. They want to work out. They want to be healthy again. They want to get rid of their pandemic weight. It's, it's amazing. And these types of companies are doing really, really well. And I don't see that ending anytime soon. Again, the younger generation is very cognizant of their health. So the four companies I share with you today, I got to tell you, um, they, they meet a, a lot of different trends. They meet a lot of different uh, angles that I'm looking for when I'm investing. So it's something, please keep an eye on that. And, and keep in mind, these are big picture. These aren't short-term trades. These are long-term investments. Again, nothing here is buyer sell recommendation of any exposure in these stocks. So there's nothing there as well. But again, uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. The markets are still down. I'll share that with you. Uh, again, we could have a, a crazy time. Think about December um, 2018. 
How is China scared the heck out of us? Ended up being a great buying opportunity. I don't think we pull back that much in the overall markets, but we're going to have a lot of volatility between now, especially tomorrow with the Fed meeting, between now and the end of the year. Uh, a lot of volatility, a lot of weird things going on. But again, stick with your long-term strategy. It pays off in the end, folks. Trust me, I've been doing this for over two decades. You have to stick with it. Uh, you start giving up on yourself, giving up on your strategy, second guessing. It leads to disaster. So we'll be back Thursday. And Thursday, I got a very fun show for you. We're going to be talking about SaaS stocks, software as a service. I have a great stat that when the software as a service index pulls back a certain percentage, which it has, historically, it bounces big, nearly 30%. We're setting up for that right now. So we're going to go through some stocks that I like in that area on Thursday. And coming up very, very soon, in probably a week or two, maybe, maybe a little bit longer, probably next two weeks, we're going to start going live. So we'll send you out a link, let you know. I'll take your questions live right here. We're just going to get back to the live shows because that's the way it's supposed to be done, folks. And we'll come back to that. But again, it's 11 days till Christmas. Get the heck out there. Get your shopping done. Hope everybody has a wonderful, wonderful week. Smile, hug somebody. Get out there. Enjoy life. The stock market's going to be here tomorrow. If your portfolio is down, there's nothing you can do. Go out there and do something that makes you smile. Thank you so much for watching. Once again, I'm Matt McCall. And that was making money.